Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. Glad to have you with us. This morning's lesson is entitled, Dare to be a Caleb, taking our text from Joshua chapter 14 and verse 12. And this verse 12 is wrapped up in the scripture reading we had this morning. I want to thank Dad for that. Joshua 14, 6 through 12. The outline was supposed to, it says through 14. I meant to have that on the slide behind me, but we'll get to that in just a second. You know, as Christians, we're told to be different, to stand out from the crowd. We're told to be lights. Jesus said that we're to let our light shine in such a way in Matthew 5, 16, that others will see it. That means it's not to be something hid. It's not to be a, a secret disciple of Christ. We're not to be a secret Christian. We're not to try to blend in and subvert from the inside. No, we're to let the world know where we stand. We're to let our light shine. They are to see it and that He might be glorified. God expects us to be conformed to His Son and not the world. He says this to us in Romans 8, 28-30. He tells us in Matthew 5, 14-16 that let our light shine, not to be hidden. Romans 12, verse 2, not to conform to this world, but transform our minds. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17, we're to come out from their midst and be separate and be holy. 1 Peter 1, 14 and 16, God says, Be holy as God is holy. As He is holy, as He has demonstrated how, what that holiness means, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it paints a picture for us when He says, Be holy as God is holy, that we ought to know what's expected of a Christian. For the great visual aid that we're about to get to in Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapters 13 to 14. But before we get there, just to get your minds talking about it, is do you remember these names? And don't look at the outline. But Shamua, Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Amiel, <coughs> Sether, Nabi, Gul. There's a hint. They're not judges. There's a great example of standing out from the crowd and being different seen in the account of the twelve spies. In Numbers chapter, in Numbers chapters 13 to 14, the 12 spies are sent out, and for 40 days they scout out the land that God is about to fulfill His promise made to Abraham hundreds of years before and give it to them, that they might inherit what Abraham trod upon. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and Romans 15, 4, we're told that the Old Testament accounts serve as our instruction and give us hope in the Scriptures. So what can we learn from this account? Ten spies gave a bad report and swayed a nation to commit sin. How many of you remember their names? If someone were to say, oh, do you remember that guy, Palti? What about Shamu? As you look at that list of names, these are not names you hear very often. And they're not names that are recorded in a good light anywhere else in Scripture. But what about if I were to mention Joshua and Caleb? These are two names that are well known. Probably Joshua more well known than Caleb. Because these two men gave a good report. They were ready to take the land when they scouted it out for those 40 days. And apparently as the 12 came back, Joshua and Caleb had it in their minds, this is it, we're going in. But the other 10 were cowering in fear. Despite the fact that they had gone into the valley of Eskel. Eskel means cluster. It's called that because they cut down a branch with a full cluster of grapes on it. It took two men to carry it back to Moses. They carried back some figs and some pomegranates. They took these good things back to them and they laid it at the feet of all the people, all the multitude in Moses, and they said, the land is good. It's exactly what God said it was. <clears throat> but there's giants in the land. And we are as grasshoppers in their sight. Joshua and Caleb said, let's take it. God has given it to us. So as we look at Caleb, he stands out from the rest. He and Joshua both stood out from the crowd. Joshua is going to become Moses' successor. And he's going to write the book labeled after him about the exploits that we can read of the battle throughout Canaan. And what in the hearts and the minds of the people on, on, when he is on his deathbed. But let's talk about Caleb. Lesser known than Joshua, but he was standing there right there, shoulder to shoulder with Joshua. He was from the tribe of Judah, Numbers 13.6. He was chosen by Judah to be the spy for them in the Canaan. And he brought back a faithful report in Numbers 13.30 while the other ten were saying, we can't do this. He says, we will overcome. And he survived the wilderness. As we know, God's wrath fell on the whole multitude. 
Because the people went with the report of the ten, not the two that said, let's do this. God is with us, let's do it. They went with the ten and they said, oh, you brought us out here to kill us. We are better off in Egypt. And God said, for every day they saw that good land. Every day they spent in the land that I'm going to give you. You're going to spend wandering in the wilderness until this generation dies out. But there will be two who enter the land. It will be Joshua and Caleb. He never forgot what he had seen as a spy, as we're going to see in Joshua chapter 14. Only he and Joshua survived. Numbers 14, 30 and verse 38 point this out. And he took action in the conquest of Canaan. He's 85 years old before he gets his inheritance, but he never stopped thinking about it. Not once did he stop thinking about it. In all those years, he had to wander the wilderness with the doomed. All he could think about was getting back into that land and doing what he set out to do when he was 40 years old. Years have meant nothing to him. In fact, I want you to read with me in Joshua 14, 6 to 11. I appreciated the scripture reading Dad read for us earlier and ask you to turn there and read it again with me. And I apologize if the colors are kind of wonky on this background. So I'll read it. I'll read it also, and you can read it along with me. It says, Then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was forty years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot is trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these forty-five years. From the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I'm eighty-five years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. And this is, an, this is an important aspect because of the request he's about to make. He's saying, I'm just as fit and healthy and strong as the day God sent me into the land to spy it out. And here's why that's important. Because in verse 12, reading from the New King James Version, Joshua 14, 12. Now therefore, what's the therefore? All that God had promised me, all that Moses had promised, and I am still fit and I'm strong and I'm healthy. Now therefore... Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. He says, Give me this mountain. Give me the hill country. Give me the fortified cities that are nestled into the hills. These places that were probably built thinking they were impregnable because of the high ground. He says, that's what I want. Give me the hill country. Give me this mountain. He says, at 85 years old, I'm ready for the hardest task. We've been fighting for five years. And the conquest for Canaan will go for seven. And at the last two years of that fighting, Caleb's saying, give me the mountain that is Hebron. Caleb put his faith into action when he asked for that mountain and to take on giants. It's not just normal people that are living in those fortified cities. These are the fortified cities of giants. And Caleb's saying, give me that as my inheritance. <coughs> See, Caleb had a different spirit. So when I say dare to be a Caleb, we're saying have a different spirit than others around you. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 24 says, but my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit, and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. His actions were approved by God. God refers to Caleb as my servant. Many of us would love to hear that. My servant. To have that moniker attached to your name, the servant of God. That's what Caleb had because he had a different spirit. He stood out from the rest. And God singled him out while they wanted to stone him. If you go back to Numbers 14, verse 10, the people wanted to stone him because he was saying, let's do this. God says, he followed me wholly or fully. He is my servant. Note the contrast of spirits between Caleb and the ten. 
Caleb was positive and willing to act on his faith. Turn with me back to Numbers chapter 13. You can place a marker there if you wish in Joshua 14. But turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. And verses 25 to 26 is when they come back after 40 days spying out the land. They come back to the Moses and the multitude. And in verse 40 and in verse 27, thus they told them and said, so they're speaking to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. And it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Remember, they brought back a cluster of grapes that took two men to carry it on a pole. They brought back pomegranates, and they brought back figs, showing that, and they're showing Moses, and they're showing all the people. You can almost imagine this good, delicious-looking fruit is on display. This is what we took out of the land. This is what's waiting for us there. And then verse 28. So they said, it does flow with milk and honey. That's the promise God made to Moses when he brought them out of Egypt. That he would guide them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, it certainly does. But then verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. <clears throat> and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites. And the Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. So here they're giving their report to Moses, and they're saying, All these different people, all these different giants are living there in the hill country. And in the hill country, notice what he says, what they said they lived there. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, in addition to the giants, are all living in the hill country. Joshua chapter 14, that's the very place Caleb says, give me this mountain, give me that hill country. And Caleb says, he quiets the people and says, we should by all means go up and take possession of it. We will overcome it. Why? Because God is on their side and God says, I'm going to give it to you. But here's the ten. The ten were negative. They acted on fear and unbelief. In verse 32 through 33. So they, gave out, so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone and spying out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in <coughs> excuse me, and all the people we, whom we saw in it are men of great size. There we also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. You can see that they acted on fear and unbelief. These men are too great for us. Not only are they behind fortified cities, but they're bigger than we are. And Caleb, he saw all that they saw. And in verse 30, as we just read, he says, we're able. We will overcome it. But the ten, gripped by doubt and fear, they said in verse 31, that the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they're too strong for us. Caleb says, we will do it. We're able. The people said, the other ten said, no, we're, we're not able. They're stronger than we are. Have they forgotten how strong Egypt was? Did they forget Pharaoh and an army barreling down under their backs as they were on the shore of the Red Sea? Did they forget the power that God displayed time and again when they were up against overwhelming forces? When God said it's going to happen, it happened. But yet they were gripped with fear and doubt. And they said, we can't do it. They're too strong for us. <coughs> Showing their complete lack of faith in God. Because no matter how big the giants were, no matter how big the fortified cities are, God was bigger than all of that. And he could do it. Caleb was active and zealous. He was willing to work to gain the victory. In Numbers 14, 6-9. It says, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who spied out the land, tore their clothes... <coughs> And we'll get to that, why they tore their clothes a little later on. You see, the people were already swaying the hearts and minds of the rest of the multitude against Moses. And so they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, this is verse 7, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he'll bring us into this land and give it to us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land. For they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Do you see the type of attitude that was in Joshua and Caleb? Why God is later going to refer to Caleb as my servant? 
He had a different spirit than the rest of the people. They're saying they're too strong for us. We can't do it. Caleb's saying, this is exactly what we've been promised. Let's take it. But the ten, they wanted the reward without the labor. Perhaps the victory without the war. In Numbers 14, starting in verse 2. If you back up to 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Well, we might have to, we might have to fight. It's better for us to go back to Egypt. What awaited them in Egypt? Would Pharaoh welcome them in open arms and give them their appointed land that Joseph had given them year, hundreds of years before and say, welcome home? What would happen when they went, if they went back to Egypt? It would be back to shackles and chains. It would be back to slavery, giving up everything that God had fought for them to win. They wanted the reward without the labor. This was too hard. This was too great a task. The people were too strong. But not Caleb. Caleb trusted in God and he had a can-do attitude. That no matter what the obstacle was, Caleb says, it's ours. You remember what they said, Joshua and Caleb both? God has removed their protection and has made them our prey. They're saying it doesn't matter how big and fortified their cities are. It doesn't matter how big and trained for war their men of combat are. God has removed their protection. And they are our prey. But Caleb would have to wait. Because the people were going to go under punishment by God. But in Joshua chapter 14 and verse 12. I title this part, Taking on the Giants. Caleb had a different spirit. And he wanted to take on those giants. The very stumbling block that kept Israel from entering the land 40 years, 45 years before in Joshua 14, 12. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Caleb asked for the hill country. New King James says, give me this mountain where the Anakim, the giants, dwelt. Just to tell you a little bit about Hebron, this area that Caleb gets as his inheritance. Hebron was 3,040 feet above sea level. It is the highest point in Palestine. It is formerly Kiriath Arba. Arba being the greatest of the Anakim. In Joshua 14, verse 15, now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba. For Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. And the land had rest for more. This hill country area, Hebron, is named after the greatest giant that had lived there. Hebron is rich in biblical history, going back to the days of Abraham. But also in Joshua 15, 13, I skipped a point. Hebron was named after Arba's son, Anak. That means giants. In Joshua 15, 13, Now he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriath Arba. Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron. So Hebron is the name of Arba's son, Anak. That's the giants when they talk about the Anakim. That's the descendants of Anak, the giants. And as I pointed out earlier, and jumped the gun, Hebron is rich in biblical history, going back to the days of Abraham. In Genesis chapters 13 through 23, what happens is, if you open up the Genesis 13, you're not going to read immediately about Hebron. It's at the very end, perhaps the very last verse. What happens is, is Moses and Lot have a disagreement among their shepherds. The land, that they have become so prosperous, the land is too small. And so Abraham and Lot, they, they don't want to fight amongst themselves. It's their servants that are fighting for land and for water. And so they separate. And Lot chooses the good pastors of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he takes his family there. And at the very end of Genesis 13, Abram, he goes to the Oaks of Mamre, which it says is at Hebron. So Abraham goes and dwells in this hill country, the very country that later Caleb is going to get as his portion, or his inheritance. And so if you go all the way through that history, after the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah, the very next chapter after that, it says Abraham and his family, they moved. And they move somewhere else. So you might wonder, why do I have chapter 23 there? 
Chapter 23, we read of Sarah's death. When Sarah dies, Abraham goes back to that hill country. He goes back to Hebron where the Hittites are. Remember the, when the spies came out? They told Moses the Hittites are still in the hill country. The Hittites were living there when Abraham brought the body of Sarah back. And there's this bartering going back and forth. He says, I want to buy a cave for the bury my wife. And the people there, there's this big council, and they're saying, whatever we have is yours. Choose the best plot of land, the best cave, bury your dead. And they go back and forth until finally one says, what is, for, what is a land worth 400 shekels of silver between us? And because he named it, Abraham counts out 400 shekels of silver, buys the plot of land, and he buries Sarah there. So Sarah is buried there in Hebron, Somewhere <clears throat> close to the oaks of Mamre. And during the conquest, if you go back to Joshua chapter 10, 3 through 27, Joshua killed the king of Hebron during this conquest. And in Joshua 20, verse 7, you can see that Hebron became one of the cities of refuge. They set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. In the context of this passage, is they're labeling out the cities of refuge. And so Hebron is rich in biblical history. Going back to the days of Abraham and going forward, it even became a city of refuge under the ten tri or the twelve tribes of Israel as the allotments were portioned out. But here's a, th a part that I really enjoy reading about Caleb. It was said of David in 1 Samuel 18, 7, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. It was this song, this phrase, that really started the jealousy between Saul and David. Not that David had anything against Saul, but Saul became so envious and jealous of David's exploits, even though he did it all in the name of Saul, he was his captain, that that began, that began the, the whole ordeal of David having to live as an outlaw, away from his family and away from his kinsmen, even going and dwelling so far with the Philistines, the enemy of his people. This was the song that started it all. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. When I think of David, I often think of David as a giant slayer. You know, if you were to give someone a title, I think of David, he's the giant slayer. But David only slew a few giants. If you look back in 2 Samuel 17, the perhaps the most famous battle with a giant is David and Goliath. But then you read in 2 Samuel 21, 16 to 22, and you read that David and his sons slew Goliath's four sons. So there's four more giants between David and his sons. We don't know how many went to each one, but there's a total of five giants there in, under David's belt. And so he truly is a giant slayer. And not to take anything away from that, but there's something important to note about Caleb. While David and his sons slew these five giants, Caleb took on the fortified cities of the giants. Think how many he went. He waited 40 years to take on the giants. The very giants that made the others feel like grasshoppers in their own sight, back in Numbers 13, verse 33. When he came to Joshua there in Joshua 14 about his inheritance, he wanted the hills that nestled fortified cities in which the giants lived so that he could drive them out with the help of the Lord. And so what if they were giants? They were on his land, and he would drive them out by the strength of God. I want you to see something important about Caleb, something that we're told in the New Testament, and this is a great visual aid for that. He still saw things through the eyes of faith, and not as they appeared outwardly. There's a lesson for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith, not by sight. This is a great visual aid of what that passage is saying. The rest of the people says we're grasshoppers in, their, in our own sight. They're too strong for us. Caleb saw him and said, Oh, we'll do it. We'll overcome it by the strength of God. And then when it came time for his inheritance, he says, Give me this mountain. I will drive them out of those fortified cities by the help and the strength of God. He was still seeing things through the eyes of faith. That 40 years wandering in the wilderness with the doomed did not diminish his faith. It strengthened it, if nothing else. It strengthened it. It gave him something to look forward to that when he came into the land... As God promised that he and Joshua would. He didn't say, give me the, the easiest spot. He was 85 years old. He could have said, I'm ready to retire at this phase in my life. Give me something easy to take. No, not Caleb. Give me the mountain. 
Give me the hill country of Hebron, the very place that was the stumbling block that kept Israel out of the promised land. That's the kind of spirit Caleb had. Do you see why God said he has a different spirit? Why God referred to him as my servant? He didn't have the mindset of the rest of the people. And it didn't matter that the whole multitude was bought, with, bought the lie of the ten spies. That they gave in to their fear. They're causing their hearts to melt. Not Caleb. He said, give me the hill country. Caleb chose the difficult task. The very one that was the stumbling block of the ten that drove the multitude to sin against him. Caleb's faith and trust in God allowed him to take on the giants and defeat them. Now that became the portion to the tribe of Judah, the hill country. They got the highest point in all of the land because Caleb was willing to go to those fortified cities and drive out the enemy, drive out the giants. Caleb's reward was the mountain promised by God. Remember he said in Joshua 14, 12, give me this hill country that God spoke about on that day. Oh, the reward was not apparent at first. This is another good lesson for us in looking at the life of Caleb. He got his reward. But it wasn't apparent at first. He stood with the minority. He and Joshua stood against the majority. Not only the majority of the spies, the ten spies, but then the multitude of Israel went with the report of the ten. And by the end of chapter 13 of Numbers, they're crying so in chapter 14, verse 1, they're lifting up their voices and crying to God. And they go so far to say, let's get a leader to take us back into Egypt. It would be better for us there. They're at the border to the promised land. The land promised to Abraham that his descendants would fill it when the sin of the Amorites was full. And they came and they said, oh, the Hittites and the Amorites, they're all there. Just waiting for Caleb says, just waiting for us to pick them off. They stood against the majority. And in fact, for it, Numbers 14, verse 10. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. So when Joshua and Caleb make that impassioned plea, their protection is removed from them. They become our prey. The people's response was to stone them. They had to wander in the wilderness with the guilty. Numbers chapter 14, 28 through 35. For every year they, they saw that good, the good of that land. For, I mean, for every day they saw the good of that land, they were going to walk a year in the wilderness. So for 40 years until that generation died out. And the ten were struck down immediately. But Caleb and Joshua had to walk with the doomed in the wilderness. Sometimes we might feel that same way as we walk through life. That we feel like we're walking with the doomed. That all we see is wickedness around us. We see sin and oppression. We see sin and wickedness. Sometimes it might feel like we're suffering because of nothing wrong that we have done. Caleb and Joshua went through that too. We certainly see it in the, in the case of Jesus when he says, follow in my footsteps. They're going to deliver you up. They're going to beat you. They're going to stone you. They're going to take you before judges and magistrates there in Matthew chapter 10. All and say, all because of my sake. Caleb had to wander in the wilderness with the guilty. But he had approval of God and his own conscience. In Numbers 14, verse 24, where he's called the servant of God, my servant Caleb. Joshua 14, 12 to 14, where it says, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. He followed his God fully. Caleb knew it. God confirms it. That he was approved by God and his own conscience. And look at the difference in him and the others during that 40 years. They wandered waiting to die. That was, their, that was their lot and their portion. Taken out of Egypt by a mighty, powerful hand, the likes of which had never been seen before. And then they were going to wander for 40 years waiting to die off. So that the new generation could inherit the land that they could have taken. What a sad state of things. What we see in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. Those disobedient to God, those who do not know God, and those who have never obeyed the gospel, they wander this life... <coughs> Waiting to die. Not a physical death, not only that, but they're waiting, they're wandering this life aimlessly, all waiting for that eternal death. Verse 9 says they will pay the penalty of eternal separation from God. 
Caleb wandered to enter the promised land and live. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, it says that the suffering here cannot compare to the glory to be revealed to us. We wander with the guilty awaiting life. 1 Peter 1, 3-4 describes it as an inheritance for our soul in heaven. So while we might wander with those wandering to die, we wander with the guilty. Like Caleb, we're wandering to live. We have something to look forward to. We're not waiting to die. We're waiting to live. We're waiting to be exalted by God. And that's certainly what happened with Caleb. In fact, as we look at his account, we see his faithfulness was never forgotten. Joshua remembered it, and the Holy Spirit recorded it for us for all time, for all eternity. That Caleb was called my servant by God. That God pointed him out and singled him out and said he had a different spirit than the multitude, than the other ten. And because of all of that, he gained the victory. In Joshua 14, verse 12, he went to Joshua and he asked for the hill country. He said, give me this mountain. In verse 15 it says, Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba. For Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. He drove out the sons of Anak. In verse 14, Joshua 15, verse 14, Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Shishai, and Ahinam, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. He went into those fortified cities and he drove the giants out, including three sons of their, an of their ancestor, Anak, that it was named after. And... In Joshua 14, verse 14, he takes Hebron and its lands, the hill country, that mountain that he asked for. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, until this day, because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. And in Joshua 15, verse 13, Now he gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriath Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is, Hebron. Caleb took Hebron and its lands, and he possessed them, and it became the inheritance for Judah. And later on, as the northern ten tribes are going to be swept away by Assyria, this area, it is this hill country, that is the tribe of Judah, that becomes that southern kingdom of Judah. They had the high ground. They had the highest point in all of Palestine. And in Joshua 21, 11 through 12, he settled down to his reward and shared it with the Levites. It says, Thus they gave them Kiriath Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah with its surrounding pasture lands. But the fields of the city and its villages they gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as his possession. So it wasn't just the hill, it wasn't just that mountain with the fortified cities nestled all in it, but it was that entire area. All its pasture lands, all its surrounding cities, all of that became the inheritance of Caleb. And became later on the tribe of Judah. He overcame adversity. Caleb was faithful to the end, and he was rewarded for it. If that sounds familiar, it ought to. We see in Caleb the spirit that we are to possess. Do we not? In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and Revelation 21, verse 7, we're told to overcome the trials of life. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. Why? Because they produce endurance. Revelation 21, 7 says, He who overcomes will inherit these things. What things? That new heaven, that new earth. The place where there's no more sorrow, no more dying, no more crying. God wipes away all tears, going back to Revelation 21 and verse 3. And just as in the case of Caleb, the reward may not be apparent. Caleb had to suffer with the wicked for 40 years, going back to Numbers 14, 28 through 35. But we're also told, as we see in Caleb, the spirit we're to possess, to be faithful till the end. No matter what happens around us, no matter what other people do around us. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, Paul says to Timothy, I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the course. There's laid up for me in heaven that crown of righteousness, not only to me, but all those who love his appearing. And in Revelation 2, 10, as Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, remain faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. See, Caleb never gave up, and he never lost his faith in God. In Joshua 14, 12 to 14, when he says, he reminds Joshua of that promise made to him by Moses that that would be his inheritance, the promise confirmed by God that that would be his inheritance, and he said, give me this mountain. And we see in verse 14, it was given to him because he followed the Lord his God fully.
And as we see in Caleb, the spirit we're to possess. As we're to have a different spirit. Overcome the trials of life. As we're to be faithful to the end. We have something to look forward to. And that is to receive the reward from God. In James 1.12... After James says in the verse part of chapter 1, 2 through 4, to count it all joy when we encounter various trials because it will produce endurance. In chapter one, in James chapter 1, verse 12, it says, After having been tried, having stood the test, other translations say, having been approved, then you'll receive the crown of life. Revelation 2.10, as we just referenced. Jesus said, Remain faithful until death, and you'll receive the crown of life. In Matthew 25, 34 and 46, as Jesus talks to those on his right, the righteous, he says, and receive the inheritance or enter into your inheritance prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In verse 46, he calls it eternal life. We see that same spirit in Caleb. He overcame and he got to enjoy the rewards that God, his God, gave him. In Joshua 14, 14 and 15, 13, as we read, these promises were from God and, they, and he gave them to him. Possibly because he asked for the hardest territory in all of Canaan to take. Give me the fortified cities of the giants. And God did so. And it became for him his inheritance. After studying the life of Caleb as it's recorded, as brief as it is, there's so much we can glean from that account. Is what kind of spirit do you possess? We're told by God that Caleb possessed a different spirit. When we stand before God on that last day, will He say that of us? You had a different spirit. You stood out from the crowd. You truly came out of their midst and were holy. You were my servant. You see, we must possess another spirit in the world. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, Don't be conformed to the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 to 16, God says, Be holy because I am holy, or be holy as I am holy. The question is, do you stand out from the crowd? And on that last day, will you have been seen to have overcome and be faithful till death? And will he say of you, this is my servant who had a different spirit. If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be. To repent, to be baptized into his name. Knowing that there is salvation found in no other name than Jesus. As we see in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. That you can repent of your sins this very hour. Be baptized this very hour and have your sins forgiven. If you are a Christian this morning in error, not living the way that you want to, don't wait till it's eternally too late. Make the choice now to have a different spirit than the world around you. No matter even those who might have been faithful with you and they turn from God, have that different spirit. You can repent and be renewed right now. If we can assist you in these things, if you're subject to invitation in any way, come forward, let it be known while we stand and while we sing.